Hey there, so now it's time to talk titration. And I know in class we've only really at this point talked about pH, pOH, and some relationships between them. So now we're going to actually get down to, to task and think about, well, what about the reaction that occurs between an acid and a base? So once we can characterize them in terms of their pH or pOH, how can we actually use stoichiometry as a tool to determine something about an unknown concentration of acid or base? Let's go back over the basics that go on in a titration process. Remember that fundamentally, when you're doing a titration, it often involves a piece of equipment called a burette. You see the burette right here. And you'll notice that the burette is filled with a blue liquid, and we call that blue liquid, liquid the titrant. That's the substance that we know the concentration of. Okay, so the titrant, we know what it is. In the lab that we did this week, or will do if you haven't yet done it, our titrant was 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. And we know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base. The burette delivers the titrant into a reaction vessel. Typically, it's an Erlenmeyer flask, like you see here, where we have put a known volume of an unknown concentration of liquid. Now in our lab, we used vinegar, just household regular vinegar, and our goal was to take something that we know about, in this case the titrant, we know the concentration, and use how much volume it takes to neutralize the sample of the acid to be able to tell us something about its concentration. Now one thing that you didn't see, I know for those of you that have done the lab, you know that adding the sodium hydroxide to the base, or I'm sorry, adding the titrant, which is a base, to our acid with the presence of an indicator, in this case phenolphthalein, resulted in a color change, and that color change was the visual indicator that the reaction was done. Well, what we didn't really talk about is what changes about the solution to make that color change. And this has a lot to do with equilibrium. The phenolphthalein indicator changes its color at a pH of around 8, in between 8 and 10. So first, I want you to think about a question for me. What do you think the pH would be of that household vinegar solution? So the solution in here before we've added anything to it. Take a minute and think about it. Now, if you thought about it, you should have predicted that the initial pH would be below 7 and it's close to around uh, 4. So as we add a base to it, we know that the base neutralizes some of the acid. So that has the effect of changing the pH. Think for a second what you think it does to the pH. Now if you said it makes the pH go up, you would be right. So if we actually tracked it over time, we would see what, would, what we would call a titration curve develop. And the titration curve for our lab would look something like this. All right, so as we added base to our sample of vinegar, we would notice a very interesting curve that would develop. Notice that as we add some base, we start to slowly increase the pH. And really where this range where it doesn't change much, and we'll talk about this later, this is something called a buffer zone. And a buffer zone is just a zone where adding even a strong base doesn't affect the pH a whole lot. But then you'll notice a sharp change. And this sharp change is where there's just very, very little unreacted vinegar in the solution. So that's where we see a sharp increase in the pH. And then we'll level off again as the solution pretty much assumes the pH value of the solution, of the titrant solution, the sodium hydroxide. Some interesting things about this graph. One point in particular that's really important to us is this point called the equivalence point, and I'm marking it here with a red X. That equivalence point is the point where we've completely neutralized all of the acid in the sample. And you'll notice that we could follow it down and say that it corresponds with a particular volume of base that we've added. In this case, it looks to be about, let's see, 5, 10, 15, so that's 20, maybe like 16 milliliters of the base would be needed to, to re react with this particular sample. Um, yours will be different, but nevertheless, that's an important feature to be able to take away from a curve like this. Now notice, this curve looks this way because we reacted starting with an acid, and we added a strong base to it, so it ends up in a pH range that's high.
Something that'd be interesting is, well, take a look at this next slide. So let's say that instead of a strong base as a titrant, let's say that our titrant was 0.5 molar HCl. And then let's say that, well, in the flask, well, what about in the flask, instead of HCl, we added something like, well, NaOH. And we just don't know what the concentration is yet. So we'll just put, what's the concentration? I don't know. So the reverse process would happen, but nevertheless, it's neutralization. The acid and the base would react to make a salt and water. Take a moment, pause the video, and predict what you think the curve over here would look like. If you want, you could take a screenshot, put it in your iPad, and actually make a sketch for a prediction. And then, and then play the video again when you're ready. Now, if you drew a curve that looked like this, you'd be spot on. Okay? Notice our equivalence point, in this case, is right around 7. And in this case, it would take, well, I just happened to draw it about the same, about 16 milliliters of the titrant added. Okay, so fundamentally, these graphs tell us quite a bit about what we're doing in the process. You'll notice that in this case, when our unknown was a base, well, it makes sense that our pH would start above 7. And in the other example where it's an acid, our pH would be below 7. Now, that's the conceptual piece. Let's look at more of the quantitative aspect. We know that a neutralization reaction is where an acid and a base react to make a salt and water. So the classic example of that could be where we have hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide and we make salt, make it a different color, green. So salt, NaCl, which is soluble, so would really exist as discrete ions. And then, of course, we've got our water. Something to pay attention to, especially as we move forward. Notice that there is a particular reacting ratio. We see a one-to-one -one ratio between hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. That's important because now when we get to the point where we're trying to do some calculations, stoichiometry kicks in and what we know about molarity. So let's see how it goes from here. And why not just do it through the context of a problem? So here's a simple problem. We've got a five milliliter sample of nitric acid. And when we titrated it, we found that it required 20 milliliters of a 0.075 molar potassium hydroxide solution to neutralize the acid sample. And this is a very common question. What's the concentration of the nitric acid? First step, well, think about it. What do you think the first step should be? Well, if you said to write the balanced equation, that's exactly right. You should always start by writing the balanced equation for these processes. So nitric acid, it's one of those strong acids that I want you to know, HNO3, plus potassium hydroxide, that's KOH. They react in a double replacement neutralization reaction, so it's going to make KNO3 a soluble salt, and it's going to make water. Now notice, in the, again, in this problem, we've got a nice one-to-one -one reacting ratio, because if you double-check your equation, you'll see that it's already balanced as written. We could clean it up and add state symbols just to show that we know our stuff. Don't forget water would be liquid. All right. Now from here, we really need to think about, well, what do I know more about? Well, for nitric acid, the only thing I know is the volume. Potassium hydroxide, on the other hand, I know the volume and I know the concentration. Boom. I know where I can go from here. I know that molarity is number of moles times the volume in liters. So I can use that to solve for the number of moles of the base that I had to use in order to neutralize the acid. Because I know that however many moles of base I used up, there has to be an equivalent number of moles of acid in the sample. Even though their volumes are different, the number of moles have to be the same. And I can draw that conclusion because there's a one-to-one -one reacting ratio. So let's see if we can work this out real quick. I'm just going to rearrange this equation. So number of moles is molarity times volume. So the molarity of my sodium hydroxide 
or sorry, potassium hydroxide, 0 0.075 molar, and the volume is 20 milliliters. I'm going to convert that to liters because the volume should be in liters, 0 0.020 liters. And the number of moles that you get is 0 0.0015 moles. And in this case, that's moles of KOH. Now, understand that that's also equal to the number of moles of HNO3 because of the 1 to 1 reacting ratio. So we could also say that we have 0 0.0015 moles of HNO3. Well, from here, all we need to do is remember that molarity, again, is number of moles divided by volume. I know all of that information, so now I can do my solution, uh, and I'll do this part in red just so you know what's really related to the base. We did the base in blue, and we did the acid component in red here. So the molarity is going to be number of moles of acid, 0 0.0015 moles of HNO3, uh, divided by the volume, 0 0.005. And when we do that, uh, we get an answer of 0.3. So our molarity is 0 0.30 molar. And we're giving our answer notice in this case to two significant figures because that's the uh, least precise value that was provided in the problem. So there's an example for you. Now use these to help you as you work through the practice problems that I've assigned for you tonight and also to help you think about the data that you collected from the lab earlier this week. Have a great evening.